Welcome, welcome, everyone. This is the SNEA ESF Ethernet Storage Forum webcast on what does hyperconverged mean to storage. This is John Kim, chair of the SNEA Ethernet Storage Forum. I'm happy to get started with this webcast. Thank you for joining us today. Let me go ahead and get started. By the way, I'm sure someone will ask, uh, will these slides be available? And yes, these slides will be available as a PDF file at the end of the webcast, and the webcast will also be available on demand through Bright Talk. Before we get started, some minor legal housekeeping, legal and copyright and trademark. The SNEA legal notice, please keep in mind, the material in this presentation is copyrighted by SNEA, unless otherwise noted. Member companies and individual members may use this material in presentations and literature under the following conditions. Slides must be uh, reproduced in their entirety without modification. Uh, SNEA must be acknowledged as the source of any material in the body of any document uh, containing material from these presentations. Some of this material is copyright storage I.O. And also, uh, this presentation is a project of SNEA, and neither the author nor the presenter nor SNEA is an attorney, and nothing in this presentation is intended to be or should be construed as legal advice or the opinion of legal counsel. If you need legal advice or legal counsel, please consult your attorney. Information presented in this webcast represents the author's personal opinion and current understanding, and uh, neither the author nor SNEA assume any responsibility or damages arising out of reliance on the use of this information. No warranties expressed or implied come with this presentation. So thank you for uh, standing by for that legal announcement. Let's go forward. I'm very uh, excited to say that SNEA, well, besides the topic, SNEA is a growing and active organization that focuses on storage networking. Over 160 member companies, 3,500 contributing members, and over 50,000 individual users and IT uh, pros are using SNEA content or SNEA materials. You can find more about us at SNEA.org or SNEA.org slash technical. I am very happy to say that today our guest presenter on hyperconverged, on what hyperconverged means for storage is Greg Schultz. Greg is an independent IT analyst. He's the founder and senior analyst at Storage IO. And in addition, in addition to that, he is a well-known blogger and author in the storage community. He's written books about cloud, uh, virtual data center, virtualization, the, uh, the software-defined data center, and storage networking. You can find out more information by following Greg on Twitter at, at @storageio. Today's topic is what does hyperconverged mean for storage? And our agenda will be talking about HCI, hyperconverged infrastructure storage and IO considerations, uh, fast why fast applications may need fast server storage IO, how to avoid bottlenecks, Understanding the difference between aggravated and, sorry, not aggravated, aggregated and disaggregated versus hybrid infrastructure. And then planning and decision making around hyperconverged infrastructure. And of course, we will be answering your questions. Please submit your questions online and then we will, uh, Greg and I will answer them as much as we can. So with that said, I would like to turn this webcast over to Greg Schultz. And if you are, we're ready to go on what does hyperconverged infrastructure mean to storage? Greg? Great. Thanks, John. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's session, What Does Hyperconverged Infrastructure, HCI, as well as Converged Infrastructure, CI, mean to uh, storage? And as a part of being converged, we're going to be touching on server, storage, I.O.-related topics, hardware, software, because after all, it is converged. Uh, real quickly, I apologize in advance. Kind of like a movie that's been formatted uh, for the widescreen. Some of the slides that you're going to see have been reformatted down to a different format to a different size screen. So I apologize in advance if some of the slides look a little busy, look a little crowded. Uh, just think of it as that the story has been adapted for a different screen size, and we'll work from there. All right, let's get right into our conversation for today. And that conversation, again, let's take that step back. Why do you want HCI or CI for that matter? What's the objective? Is it around technology or is it around the outcome result? And what we're showing here is a balancing. In other words, you've got CI, converged infrastructure, hyper-converged infrastructure, HCI, cloud, cluster in a box, cloud in a box, CIB. What is your focus and objective? Is it the technology, leveraging something new, using a new tool or a trend, 
or new architecture or packaging or solution or what's being talked about? Or over on the other side, is it about the outcome? Addressing particular issues, enabling some opportunity to benefit your organization or your business, to help facilitate a tool for transition. Is it around the hardware? Is it around the software? Is it around the management tools, the interfaces? What's your objective? Well, having said that, let's dig into this a little bit more. And here's a couple different things. Again, we're setting up this conversation about the why, the HCI, CICIB, to get into the how, the what, the where, the when, all these different aspects. One of the common questions I get is, hey, Greg, what's the best HCI or CI solution? Well, it depends. That's my standard answer. It depends. What are you trying to do? What are you trying to accomplish? What's your focus? Different types of environments have different needs, different application requirements, different resource needs. But at the heart of it is converged infrastructures, or HCI if you prefer, is combining the server compute, the I.O. networking, the storage, the hardware, the software, the management tools. In other words, if you look over on the right there on the screen, you see the basic core building blocks, the servers, I.O. networks, storage, management tools, ooey gooey dashboards, PowerShells, command language, APIs, and other buzzword bingo terms. But what is it that you're converging about? Now, something to keep in mind here is convergence. HCI, CI. Is it about saving costs? Maybe. Is it about reducing complexity to reduce costs? Perhaps. And we'll get into that a little bit more. But one of the things I want to mention right up front is that one, if your focus is simply to cut costs, to save money, um, you could very easily go into the HCI, CI world and end up paying more up front. But this is where you have to look at the bigger picture of things in that what does that solution enable for you? Does it allow you to be more productive? Does it allow you to be more elastic, more resilient? Does it allow you to scale and address different things? So part of that is the value of CI, HCI, as opposed to the cost. What does that value bring in terms of saving time on acquisition, deployment, management, scaling, and other sorts of things? But here's where I want to start setting the stage a little bit more for is that there are different sizes, different types, and different focused solutions because there's different kinds of environments. Everything is not the same. A one size or approach doesn't fit all scenarios. You've got large environments, small, application focused. Some CI, HCI solutions are for smaller environments. Some are for larger environments. Some are focused around VMware, some around Hyper-V, some around uh, open systems, open stack, uh, some are heterogeneous. But one of the things to watch out for as we go deeper into our conversation of what HCI means from a storage standpoint and from a server and from an I.O. standpoint, because they're all connected, is watch out for hyperconvergence causing hypercomplexity and hypercompromise, in other words, limiting your ability to grow, to scale, and so forth. So let's build out on this a little bit more here as we go. So what is your convergence focus? That's a recurring theme. Step back. Look at your environment applications. What is your workload today and tomorrow? What type of performance and availability excuse me, do you need? Do you need IOPS? Do you need bandwidth? Do you need low latency? Do you need to support more concurrent workload? Are you looking around efficiency in terms of utilization, in terms of space reduction, or are you looking for effectiveness as in productivity? as an enablement. What is it that you're looking for? What type of uh, characteristics does your workload have? Different applications have various resource demands that affect what's going on. So again, what are you focused on? Is it the hardware, the server, the storage, the I.O. networking? Is it the software, the hypervisor, the containers, the operating system, file systems, cloud management tools? Is it around data protection, backups, BC, DR, uh, high availability, security, durability? Is it around particular tools or feature functionality? Is it around something simple as focused around vendor giveaways, free swag, who has the best party at a conference? All of which can be valid, but what's your focus around convergence? If you know what your focus really is and how that ties back to the business, the applications, now all of a sudden we can start navigating our way 
through some of the different options, some of the different information that's out there in the marketplace. What it comes uh, back Greg, to you mentioned. Go ahead, John. Greg, you mentioned that. Sorry, you mentioned applications. By the way, I, I thought that was uh, that was cute about the part about who has the vendor swag or the best party. I, I suspect that some IT decisions actually hinge on those things. But uh, talking about applications, what are the typical applications that people want to run on hyperconverged or that makes sense to run on hyperconverged infrastructure? John, that's a great point in that all environments are different. Some environments are big, some are small. Some the smaller ones might be running, looking to run everything, everything from VDI workspaces to databases to uh, exchange uh, email systems to SharePoint. Other environments may be looking to leverage, at least initially, um, a CI, HCI solution for particular uh, functionality. Maybe it's just VDI. Maybe it's just uh, workspaces. Maybe it's just database. In some cases, and again, this is why there's different solutions that focus on different areas. Some HCI, some CI solutions focus around VDI workspaces. Some are general purpose. In other words, everything from SQL Server, Oracle, MySQL, open source, uh, different uh, NoSQL and SQL databases. Some are focused around big data. And this is the interesting thing is that when you look at the CI, the HCI uh, space, John, and everybody else, is that there's the market defined by particular product, but then there's the bigger, broader opportunity, which are all the different applications. So there are actually HCI solutions that are out there. You may not hear about them on a regular basis that are specific for big data, for Hadoop, for MapReduce, for doing analytics, or SAP, uh, for SAS, uh, among many other things. There's even some HPC or high-performance compute-focused things so again, it really comes back to is depending on the environment that you could be having your regular applications running on an HCI, but then it also comes back to is what do different solutions do enable, support, and adapt to those different uh, um, to those different capabilities? Does that help? It does. And actually, there's a question that came up, and the question is, I think everyone has an idea what big data is. The question is, what is little data? Little data is as simple as anything that's not, excuse me, anything that's not big data is little data, okay? I'm not sure if it's in the SNEA dictionary, but little data just simply refers to things that aren't big data. In other words, little data encompasses traditional databases, traditional structured traditional, semi-structured, even traditional unstructured that people don't view as being big data. One of the issues there is that some assume big data only means Hadoop, analytics, or things like that. Well, okay, then there's little data. Um, likewise, analytics can mean a lot of different things from SAS to SAP to Splunk, um, a long, long list of different things. It's a good question. Very interesting. So you're saying that there are uh, you could have hyperconverged infrastructure that runs everything, or you could have hyperconverged infrastructure that's designed for one purpose, like just SQL databases or just big data, or as you mentioned, just HPC or, or something like that. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's where, again, if we step back a little bit, you know, there's some market estimates that put the size of the CI, HCI market at a couple of billion dollars. Well, some of those estimates are based upon what current vendors, what some particular products are focused on. In other words, smaller environments, VDI, specialized workloads. But if you take a step back and look at the bigger, broader aspect of converged, hyper-converged, not based on particular product or vendor definition, that market opportunity scales way beyond a couple of billion dollar capability. In other words, when you go out and look at for example, some of the uh, Hadoop and some of the Splunk and some of the other big data uh, analytic converged platforms, or even some of the database-centric uh, converged. Granted, some of the converged players will jump up and down like uh, Donkey on Shrek and saying, well, that's not converged, that's not converged, only we are converged. Well, again, take that step back, and what is your focus, what is your point of convergence? Is it the functionality, the application, the product, the solution? Everything is not the same, so there's a lot of different options that are out there. Okay, very good. Please, please go on. 
Oh, great. So here's a couple of things. And again, what we want to do here is, you know, work our way in and through this, but also expand the thinking around what is converged and hyperconverged. And if you think of it this way, something as simple as on this chart right here, where it's the focus on the applications and the data, or it's the focus on the data and the applications. We need to expand the conversation beyond just the data. Because what use is data without an application? What use is an application without a data? The two combined create information. So having said that, if we look in this chart, we've got some sample workloads, some sample applications there. And then sitting below that in that dotted box, we've got a mix of software and hardware and different feature, different functionality, different management tools across those common basic core components we talked about a little bit ago, which are the servers, the I.O. networking, the storage. If we keep those in perspective, then all of a sudden we start to see, or we should get to this, aha, if we're not there already, we should very shortly, which is all applications have some attribute of performance, availability, capacity, and economics. The acronym is PACE, P-A-C-E, not to be confused with the Picante or the Salsa, PACE. All applications, all workload have some PACE requirements. It could be high, it could be low, and it could be more server, it could be more storage, it could be more I.O. compute. But what are your application resource needs, hardware, and software? Now, here's where hopefully we can get to the aha if you're not there already, or I'm going to tell you how to watch for the aha. That aha is look what's above the dotted box those applications, those workloads, realizing that they have these different performance requirements. And how are they going to impact the servers, the storage, the I.O. networking? Keep in mind that with a converge or with a hyper-converge, we are consolidating. We are converging and bringing things together. And one of the things that we have to watch out for, and in your intro, John, uh, I picked up on a Freudian slip, which is we have to watch out for Aggregation, which is consolidating and converging, causing aggravation, i.e. bottlenecks. We'll dig into that here um, over the next couple of slides. So, again, what are your application resource needs? Go ahead. Got it. It's very interesting. By the way, I love a good salsa, but I guess it has nothing to do with uh, hyperconverged, and it's, it's a different kind of pace. So how, how do I know if hyperconverged is right for me, and if I decide to do it, how do I decide what kind of hyperconverged or which hyperconverged solution I should do? Yeah, great point. Um, and again, it's coming back to that application. What are your application workload and what are their performance, availability, capacity, and economic requirements? You know, there's a list of the uh, some sample applications. We already touched on some of those. And again, also, what do you need or want to use the CI HCI for? What are your current resources? What are your current workloads? What do you have for hardware? What do you have for software? What are your current storage issues? What are your current current resource needs? So what it comes back to is which is the best CI or HCI? It goes back to what is it that you're trying to do? Is it you're trying to boost performance on the server or on the storage side? Are you trying to move away from a particular hardware vendor or a particular software? Are you trying to address a particular bottleneck? Are you trying to uh, save upfront cost? Are you trying to simplify streamline management? It, it comes back to which is the best. It ties back to those applications. But let's see if we can't flush out that question a little bit more um, as we go through these next slides and come to the conclusion. So as we move on, again, how will you protect your applications? Security, reliability, granularity, resiliency, fault isolation, redundancy. How are you going to scale up? How are you going to scale out to support growth? Can you bring your own hardware or software licenses? Do you have or need to keep scale resources independent of each other? And what I mean by this is, do you need the ability, the flexibility to increase server compute capability, either more CPU, more memory, or more server I.O., or do you need that ability to scale the storage capability, either from a space capacity or from an I.O., from an IOP, a bandwidth, a latency perspective, you need to scale the resiliency. What is it that you need that you require to support those applications? This is where it starts to flush out which is best for you, CI, HCI, and what particular solution. 
keeping these things. In other words, if we step back and look at what are the different requirements, what are your needs, we can start to work our way, navigate our way, what is the best approach. Something else to keep in mind is that when you go to a converged, a CI or hyperconverged system, will you violate any warranties if you make a configuration change to that system, if you attach your own hardware or attach any other software? Are there any potential issues? If you know these questions up front, these are all things, these are all decision-making points that you can use to help navigate and help make a determination of what is best and what's applicable to your particular environment. Are there uh, converged infrastructure options which, so I sort of assume that hyperconverged or conversion that you had to buy the hardware and software together. Are there software options where you can buy just the software and create your own uh, converged Absolutely. or hyperconverged solution? Absolutely. And this is where it goes back to John and everybody else is think about there is the solution. Okay, and we could get on the software defined bandwagon and, and talk about it's all about the software, but keep in mind, software still has to have hardware to run on somewhere, even if it's cloud or virtual. There are solutions that are available as software only that you can download and uh, run in your existing environment. There are some that you can even download and try um, in a virtual environment using your virtual machines and set up get a feel for them, how do they work, how do they interface into your environment with your management tools. Um, there are many solutions that are tin-wrapped. In other words, it's about the software, but they're tin-wrapped. And things have loosened up quite a bit over the last couple of years, where initially there were some solutions where you could get them in any color, kind of like the old Model T, uh, as long as it was on that particular provider's hardware. And then the uh, some of the vendors got smart, got wise, and said, well, if it's about the software, why don't we offer it on a Lenovo, or why don't we offer it on a Cisco, or on an HP, or on a Dell, or on a Huawei, or a, whoever's hardware it happens to be. So you're seeing that, and you're also seeing more of, here's the software, you go pick and choose, we've got these validated approaches, how would you like to run? Likewise, there are some that allow you to bring your own license. For example, if you've got a VMware environment, in some scenarios, with some caveats, there's always some caveats, you can bring your own licenses and contribute them to creating a hyper-converged, converged type environment, in addition to picking choosing. So there's a lot of different options that are out there now, depending on what you want to do or what you need to do. And again, it ties back to how will these all tie in to your existing environment, um, as well as to support your different application needs. I'll pause there for a moment. Okay, very interesting. Actually, there is a question uh, about from the audience about you know what's the difference between HCI versus you know hyperconverged versus converged. But I think you're going to cover that in a few slides. So maybe let's hold that question until you get to uh, get a few more slides down. Yeah, I mean we can answer that one real quick. HCI aggregated where you scale server compute linearly or or in the same way with the storage capacity. If you add one server, you add a storage. If you add a storage, you add a server. In other words, they're aggregated, they scale in lockstep. Uh, converged is known as disaggregated. In other words, you can scale the compute independent of the storage. You need more compute, more server processing, need more memory, simply add it. You need more storage capacity, whether it be space or I.O. to address, to support the server I.O simply add more storage, so disaggregated. A way of thinking about it, and I'll probably get in trouble over this one, but think of traditional SANs, traditional NAS, even traditional object-based, where you have servers that are separate from the actual storage systems. That's basically disaggregated. And then in a converged approach, it's taking those resources, putting them into a common box, a common frame, a common cabinet, a common chassis, a common dual or quad uh, type server. So the fundamental is converged, is a disaggregated, but brought together, hyperconverged, aggregated. Got it, so, very helpful. Okay, let's, oh, sorry, please, please go on. Oh, no worries, no worries. It's actually good to uh, get that into the conversation right up front. So again, what do you need? How do you need to handle your environment? Do you need more compute? Do you need more storage space capacity? You need to support mixed hypervisors. This is an interesting trend where some solutions 
are focused around VMware. Some are around Citrix, some are around Microsoft Hyper-V, uh, some are around KVM Zen, some support multiples. And what you're starting to see is where a solution might have a VMware cluster and a Hyper-V set of nodes, and on a go-forward basis, I would look for solutions that actually allow you even more granularity of having a mix, just like customers' environments, where you're seeing more and more VMware and Hyper-V and KVM Zen all coexisting in a common environment. Well, if that's in your environment at some point, you may want to start converging those from some aspect. A couple of things about tools here. Over on the right, you know, we've talked about server, we've talked about storage, I.O., hardware, things like that. We can't forget about the management tools, whether it's the uh, tools for configuring, provisioning, the ooey gooey dashboards, the command lines, the PowerShells, but we can't forget about the people. We've got to factor that in, in that we're converging hardware, software, technology tools, but what about the people? So this is where it's important that we have to keep the people in mind and be able to allow and support the people to gain, expand their trade craft skills, similar to what we're doing today, which is helping people explore and expand on what they know. And as a part of the tools, you know, one that comes up all the time is, well, how do we compare the different CI and HCIs? It's real simple. With your application, the best application, the best way to test, to simulate, to try is your own application. The second option is something as close as possible to it. In other words, be realistic. Unless your environment workload is running Iometer, run something that's further up the stack like your own application, or if you've got to move down a step, um, log in VSI if you're VDI or uh, VM Mark, or take a step down database like with uh, SysBench or YCS Bench or uh, Benchmark Factory, something like that, or uh, Slob if you're uh, Oracle. But be realistic, but also, since you're converging, Look at the converged impact, the end-to-end, -end, not just at the device, not just at the component. In other words, yeah, Iometer is good for looking at the storage. iPerf is good for looking at the network. Look at the entire stack, how the converged solution works, behaves, and operates under load. All right. Um, whoop, did we? Yep, there we go. That was a quick jump. This one I want to be really quick with. And it's really simple. This is one of those that it looks busy because, again, it got sized down. It's like when you go from a, uh, a high-def screen that's nice and wide to that narrow formatted. Real quickly here, on the left, that's how you've done things in the past, SANS, NAS, things like that, disaggregated. In the middle, they're going hyper-converged, where you've got the workload. You're running on a cluster of nodes that are converged or hyper-converged that uh, uh, aggregated – hyper-converged, disaggregated, uh, converged. Here's what you want to watch out for. As you scale from what might be seen as complex on the left to simplified in the middle, as you grow that converged, hyper-converged environment, watch out for reintroducing the complexity of the islands of technology that you have moved away from. In other words, look for solutions that if you need to grow, that you need to expand, that allow you to scale up, but also scale out while reducing complexity as opposed to introducing uh, uh, new complexity. Think of it this way. You can build a really large, sophisticated network using lots of small switches. Looks really cool on a graph, looks really sophisticated, but what happens if you start to use larger devices where you scale up, but also scale out? You can support even larger environments with less complexity. So that's what it really watches out here is watch out for hyper-compromising or inducing hyper-complexity when scaling. All right, so let's bring it back. It's about supporting the applications. It's about allowing to support your applications to be converged or hyper-converged. And in this case here, this is a generic model. That could be a converged, i.e., uh, disaggregated. That could be a hyper-converged, i.e. aggregated. I haven't told you which it is yet, but a couple key points here that I want to bring into the conversation is that most converged, whether HCI or CI today, are tied to a hypervisor, tied to a virtual machine or to uh, containers. 
And um, with that, you have the I.O. that's going between the virtual machines themselves, supporting the different applications. You have the I.O. that's going um, also additional north-south, up and down from the VM down to uh, uh, a storage device, for example. But you also have east-west traffic, that traffic that's moving between the different nodes and that cluster. Um, it could be for replication, synchronization. It could be for vMotions or live migrations, moving your applications across those different nodes for load balancing. It could be for data replication, other sorts of things, part of that scaling. And this is something to keep in mind that as you scale, how does that back end scale to support both north-south accessing device uh, storage, whether it be hard drives, solid state drives, um, NVMe type devices, but also that east-west, communicating, synchronizing across the different nodes. And again, here's where you can plug in uh, your favorite technologies, whether it's PCI, InfiniBand, uh, Ethernet, Rocky, SMB3 Direct, take your pick. The different hardware, the different protocols, the different stacks all plug into those different uh, points there. Interesting. Is, is it fair to say, however, that the vast majority of hyperconverged deployments use Ethernet as the connection fabric, or are there or is that the most popular technology for connecting? The most. It's a good point, John. Especially since we're uh, we have the Ethernet storage uh, here hosting this environment today. How about this? The most common common denominator in converged hyperconverged is around IP, some UDP. Okay. Most of that okay. happens to be on Ethernet, and increasing amount of that, the bulk of these solutions, particularly as you start to get more busy, are 10 gig going to 25, 40, 50, on up. There are also a fair amount, some of it is moving over and starting to leverage um, you know, Rocky-enabled adapters, some of it is on InfiniBand, some of it is on uh, uh, PCIe, it, it's a com, it, 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 it's um, uh, a mix of all those. But, yeah, the common denominator is IP over some mechanism, and, yes, a lot of it is some variation of Ethernet, even Ethernet on, um, you know, instead of band adapters, which I think you know a little bit about, John, is, uh, for example, I run my own um, um, InfiniBand cards, I put them in uh, IP mode or I put them in uh, Ethernet mode. You know, it's part of the idea of leveraging Rocky or RDMA over converged Ethernet. So, yeah, that's a, that's a common theme. Very interesting. So I just wanted to let the audience know that uh, we just had about five new questions pop in in the last couple of minutes. We will be getting to as many questions as possible. I'm going to have Greg go on now with the slides to make sure we finish, but we will be uh, addressing as many questions as we can online, and any questions we don't get to in the webcast, we will answer, uh, in, have a, provide written answers in a blog that's posted on the SNEA website. So uh, that's it. Greg, please go on. Great. Thanks, John, and thanks, everybody, for bringing those questions in. We're going to work them in as we go here. Hey, you know, John, you brought up a little bit ago about what is HCI versus CI and which is best. Well, here's a, here's a really, really simple way of looking at it. Um, again, on the left is converged infrastructure, disaggregated. What many of you may know, if you're running – uh, SANS, whether they be iSCSI, SAS, Fiber Channel, FCOE, InfiniBand, whatever they happen to be, or even NAS, you're familiar with the ability that you have your servers at scale independent of your storage, and then some network tying those together. On the right, you have the HCI, the aggregated. In other words, as you increase, as you add a node, if you add a node with four uh, processors, uh, that's going to be consistent. In other words, you're scaling with like with uniformity. But let's dig into this a little bit more and show some of the comparisons. Okay, converged infrastructure, i.e., disaggregated. So a couple things going on here. I'm not going to read these line by line. But in general is that you are scaling your resources. You're scaling the performance, the availability, the capacity, the economics, that pace term. You're scaling those independent. You can increase the amount of compute. You can increase the amount of storage. You can add more uh, fast, solid state, all flash, independent of hard drives. You can add more compute with more memory or compute with uh, faster or even specialized processors where you might need uh, 
uh, graphic processing units, uh, GPUs, or ARMs, or something like that. But the key point is you're scaling independent of your different resources. And there's different solutions that are out there that are packaged different ways, some for the small environments, some for large rack scale type deployment. Questions are, can you bring your own hardware? Can you bring your own license? What does the solution scale? How does it scale with stability? Okay, let's go take a look at HCI. Well, here you're, con you're converging the compute, the I.O., and the resources, but you're, compute, you're, you're, you're uh, scaling those with dependent. In other words, as you add compute, you add storage. As you add storage, you add compute. Now, this comes back to some vendors only have one approach. Some are only HCI, so the answer to everything is HCI. Some are converged only. So guess what the answer there is? Well, converged. You also have some vendor whose software can be deployed either as HCI aggregated or converged, disaggregated, depending on what you need. That's a new growing trend. So again, it comes back to what is it that you need to do? What is it that you want to do? And if you've got a particular vendor or product focused, well, then that might dictate what your capabilities are or that you can do. But if you take that step back and say, well, it really doesn't matter to me if I'm aggregated or disaggregated. I just need this functionality. What is that functionality then that you need? That should then be your focus area. So the key around HCI is that it's aggregated. And again, common questions similar to those of CI is, can you bring your own hardware, your own licenses? How does the solution scale with stability and so forth? Okay. Greg, now, Greg we actually ahead. have... Oh. So we have two questions, which are very similar, so I'll put them both out. Maybe, maybe they're the same question phrased two different ways. Uh, one, the first question is, related to the HCI answer, what about vendors who allow for storage growth and or uh, server compute growth and storage additions? Is that a way to allow both aggregated and, dis and disaggregated? Uh, and then the other question, if you just bear with me for a second, is... Um, Sorry, just a second. Look, there was another yeah, question fact, what, I thought. Yeah, well, you looked that up. I'll answer, I'll answer the one real quick, John, which is, yeah. Okay. Uh, there are some solutions that will allow you to add external storage, add external compute, and then that might be blurred the line. Is that HCI or is that a CI or is that hybrid? That's a growing trend where solutions are able to start using uh, your existing storage to start expanding above what they've been limited to. Um, so yeah, there are solutions that are out there that give you that capability if that's what you need. Okay, and then here's the, I found the other question is, what about those HCI solutions that allow us to disaggregate the link between storage and compute nodes, such as Cisco HyperFlex or HPE SimpliVity? Uh, is that the same question? Is it basically... You know, they're, they're very, very are, similar in that, you know, some of those allow you, again, it's some, here's what some of the vendors have jumped on the HCI bandwagon, even if they're hybrid or if they're flexible, just so that they can be associated with, to have that affinity of saying, oh, yeah, yeah, we're part of the HCI conversation as well, where, in fact, they could very well be a hybrid or have it your way sort of approach. Got it. Okay, very good. All right, let's, uh, let's go on. Okay, so um, good good points, good uh, good things to uh, work into the conversation. Real quickly here, keep in mind, aggregation, which is consolidating, which is converging, which is bringing things together, causes aggravation. Aggregation causes aggravation, i.e. bottlenecks. In other words, you're bringing all these different workloads together, call it the blender effect, call it the converging, consolidating, whatever you want to refer to it as, okay? So here's the thing. Are you going to throw more hardware at it? I know some vendors who would love that to be the answer. Some are going to say, well, let's just throw more software at it. Well, again, part of it, keep in mind, there is efficiency, which is about utilization, which is about space savings, but there's also effectiveness, which is productivity, getting work done. So what I have to keep in mind here is that the best I.O. is the I.O. you don't have to do. The second best is the I.O. that has the least impact where you have the best locality close to your applications, and then when you do need to go out and actually do I.O., that it has relatively low overhead, 
fast applications need fast um, software in the stack that needs fast servers that need fast IO and storage. Likewise, if you have a lightning fast storage system, you better have a fast IO path, a fast server, and fast software. Otherwise, you will have a bottleneck, and it may not be because just of all the applications. So again, watch out for that aggregation causing aggravation in those speed bumps. Okay, so um, on this particular slide here is, um, oops, sorry about that. On this particular slide here, okay, we know solid state is fast, or we better know that. Uh, here's the thing. So there's a lot of the conversations, yes, yeah, solid state is fast, disk is dead. We've heard disk is dead for decades. But here's the reality to it, is rather than talking about some of the really impressive marketing hero numbers around solid state, sequential reads, small reads, and stuff like that. Again, it goes back to what is your application? What is it that you're doing? What is it that you need to support? That performance, that availability, that capacity. Do you need small IOPS or do you need big bandwidth? And what I'm showing here is just, this is just a workload that I ran real quick, just to kind of show, not to beat up on the hard drive, but to point something out which is that a lot of these converged, hyper-converged systems, along with their hypervisors, do a lot of caching, but they also do a lot of logging, a lot of journaling, a lot of buffering, uh, data services, replication, snapshots, a lot of different things. So while the read performance is important, we also have to focus, keep in perspective those writes. In other words, how are you going to write those both random as well as sequential to support the journaling, to support the logging, to support the snapshots, the replication, the movement, the migration. And likewise is uh, some of the different metrics. But something else to keep in perspective here is that since we're converged, we get to talk about server storage I.O., not just storage, but about how they tie together. And keep in mind, you can't do an I.O. without server compute and without memory. So one of the metrics to take a look at is that when you're looking at impressive NVMe, PCIe, or whatever it happens to be. In addition to looking at the IOPS, in addition to looking at the megabytes, in addition to looking at the latency and the QDEPs, things like that, look at the amount of CPU that's used per I.O. Because those CPU cycles, if you're consuming a lot of CPU to do your I.O.s, guess what? You're taking CPU cycles away from running those applications that are part of that converged infrastructure. So it's an interesting way of looking at it. Do something as simple as take your IOPS and uh, divide into that the amount of CPU and start looking at not just IOPS to IOPS. Start looking at your, I, uh, your CPU overhead per IOP. And it starts to become rather interesting, particularly with technologies such as NVMe. All right. And as I mentioned, hey, we know the hard drive is dead, uh, but they're still out there. So, again, what are you looking for? Just straight low cost or a good amount of performance or something in between. Look Like solid state, solid state, look at it on a cost per IOP, that productivity basis. Drive, that tends to be more around that space capacity. And you can download these and look at them closer on the PDF and actually just see how different drives behave and perform for different sort of workloads. It's not a one size fits, eats, or meets everything. I advise get as much flash solid state as you can. Get as much NVMe as you can. But if you still need capacity, do it like I do. Still use some drive, but use them in new and different ways. All right. So this, so this slide here is showing, this slide is basically showing that uh, different types of hard drives uh, if you go, we're, it just offer different performance characteristics, it looks like. So you know, different transactions. You know, Absolutely, and some have more capacity, but there's some interesting things there is that without going deep into that, and you can go deeper on my site, I've got all kinds of companion resources to this, John, but what it really says is that the drives continue to evolve and that you've got drives today, um, for example, 10K drives that have high capacity in the terabytes that are faster than previous 15K. So there's a lot going on. We know the future is solid state, it's flash. Um, non-volatile memory, um, you know, NVMe, 3D X points, storage class memories, et cetera. But there's still that place for the spinning drives. 
Got it. Um, so, hey, there's a, a, there's a question. Uh, someone asked, are we going sure. to provide the slides? The answer is yes, the slides will be available as a PDF after this webcast is over, as well as you can rewatch the webcast uh, on demand through Bright Talk. And, Greg, here's a, here's a question that maybe we should address before we go on to your next slide. The question is, do HCI vendors rebalance the compute, I.O., or store, and or storage automatically as you add more nodes? Yeah. Uh, boy, if I didn't know better, that was probably positioned by a, uh, a vendor, but it could, it's also a very legitimate question, is that some solutions, they vary in how they rebalance the workload. Some rebalance on intervals, some are dynamic. Uh, it, it varies um, on how they rebalance, when they rebalance, and what they rebalance. So, again, that's one of those good questions, which is as you add that capacity, as you change, how will those resources also be reallocated? Um, how will they be made available? Is it simply adding more capacity, or is it also increasing the availability? Is it also addressing that performance aspect of pay? So good question. All right, real quickly here, because we're uh, running low on time, what I want to show here is that, you know, we showed that about the aggregation causing aggravation. Well, certainly you can throw more hardware at it, more solid state, more flash, uh, but there's also the software. There's caching. There's caching that could be recache. It could be right through. It could be right back. You've got tiering where you're moving things around from one tier to the other. And then somewhere in between there is micro tiering. So just think of it as that you've got read cache, you've got write cache, you've got moving things around. And again, this is one of those download the slide, take a look at it, and it just kind of walks you through how you can address that I.O. In other words, the best I.O. is the one you don't have to do. The second best is the one with the least impact that can come out of a cache or that can come out of that buffer that doesn't force you to go down. Um, likewise, how do you do tiering? Well, tiering is great. You can extend your capability, but tiering is also usually associated with movement, with work, with overhead that can impact what you're running. So what we're just showing here is that there are different ways of doing caching, of doing tiering, and introducing this idea, this concept of around something like a hybrid of a micro tier, which I'll show you here on this next chart. And the idea of this is that with traditional caching, um, you're taking, a, for example, a solid state, or maybe you're using a RAM cache, but you're taking a resource and you dedicate that, um, either all or a big chunk of it, to being that cache. In other words, you're not getting, um, you're not able to use that device for other things. Now, if you've got a busy environment, that may be a non-issue because then you're effectively using it. But what I'm showing here is, for example, um, a RAID set, two drives spinning, and uh, with their relative capacity. Um, over on the left. And then the next one, um, the one that shows the tall bar, that is showing a micro tier, which is kind of like a, somewhere between a cache and a regular tier. But the, here I, the idea being is that if you take a 600 gig drive and combine that with a 400 gig solid state drive with a micro tier, you get an aggregate. In other words, that total capacity jumps to one terabyte. With a cache, usually that capacity is that of what the device you're accessing is. So that's why this is kind of a hybrid. What we're showing here is that that solid gray line is showing you the performance, the number of IOPS. Obviously, as you jump from the drive to the, uh, the NVM to solid states, you're going to get a performance boost. But if we look at it in a different way, again, we're looking at here are compound metrics combined. And this is part of it, is looking at things with Converge in an um, aggregated view. What this is showing is that over on the right, you're getting the performance, okay, but you only have that capacity of the fast device or the capacity along with its cache, but you have a limited amount of space. So what this is, is it's a best of. And it's something new that's coming into the marketplace. You're seeing different variations of it. Some of them are in the operating system by some big-name vendors. Some are in the hypervisors by some big-name vendors. It will go by different names. Some will just simply call it caching. Some will simply call it tiering. You've also got third-party products that can plug in, um, whether it be on Linux, Windows, or other things. So it's just another one of these things that's showing up in the marketplace as a way to help alleviate aggregation causing aggravation. So Got it. we so, start wrapping up. Uh, well, yeah, 
Yeah, go ahead and do the closing comments, and then we have uh, there are a bunch of questions queued up, and then I have a few of my own questions, so we'll see how many Perfect. we can squeeze in. But go ahead. Yeah, and so we'll just you know real quickly here is how will your service and storage be converged? What again? Go back to what are you converging? Hardware, software, management tools. Don't forget about the people. Don't forget about the different tools. What do you currently have? What's in your environment? How will it converge to hyper-converged plug into your existing environment from a networking, from a server, from a storage, from a hardware, from a software, from a management tool? Keep your application workload in perspective. Remember that acronym, PACE, performance, availability, capacity, and economics, and that there's a lot of different variations of packaging of CI, HCI, TIN wrap, software wrap, apples to oranges. One approach, one protocol, solution, or service doesn't fit all your needs. My contact information is there, where you can find me, where you can get more information. John, let's go to the questions. Absolutely, Greg. So uh, I would say one question is, let's see here. So one question that came up is, uh, what types of workloads are not a good fit for hyperconverged? Or what types of environment or workloads are not a good fit? Yeah. Um, I'm going to turn that around in that there's, the caveat is real simple, is that there are some workloads that aren't applicable to particular products, to particular product architectures, product packaging, or product implementations, okay? So if you go to some of the traditional HCIs, and if you're, for example, looking to run a, a high-performance compute, you might be looking in the wrong area. If you need to be running a big data or a high-performance compute, you might want to go look at those vendors that provide a converged, a hyper-converged, that may not be in the normal HCI conversation. So, again, what that comes back to is that there are some workloads that aren't applicable to particular products um, or particular vendors, but that there are other vendors or other products or other solutions that may be suitable for a particular application. Got it. And then... Uh, you mentioned in the micro, you know, in the micro tiering and the caching slide, you said that this could be done by the OS or by the hypervisor or by third-party software. So that brought me to one question: Does hyperconverge always have a hypervisor? Um, does, it, does it need one by definition? You know what? Uh, most of the where you hear the popular HCI vendors, uh, they are focused around having that hypervisor because most of them are focused around VMware or Hyper-V or KVM, then OpenStack or right on down that list, so many of them do. But again, it gets back to what is your definition, what is your objective, what are you trying to accomplish with converged or hyper-converged? Some products are that way. Um, some might be running um, Oracle virtual machines for that matter. Okay, got it. And then we have uh, two questions about networking. and I. Let's see if they're really the same question. Uh, well, let me ask the first one, and then we'll see about getting to the second. So it said, uh, current HCI full-stack solutions claim compute and storage convergence, but what about the network? Given the east-west traffic introduced by HCI solutions, what networking solutions should customers be looking at? Yeah, it's a great point in that most of these solutions that are the more commonly touted HCI solutions, Part of their convergence is their packaging, in other words, the hardware, and that's the server, the compute, that's the storage, the devices, but that also includes some type of networking. Uh, that includes the PCIe uh, networking, that includes some form of whether it's uh, 10 gig Ethernet or uh, 25, 40, 50, 100, whatever it happens to be. Um, some are InfiniBand based, but most of those solutions have some sort of network that is a part of the solution, that's the hardware, and some of them also have a back-end software-defined networking capability as part of their stack. Okay, very interesting. Yeah, I think my, my observation as a networking vendor is we've seen most of the hyper-converged solutions include the networking cards, and as you mentioned, some of them include software-defined networking, uh, but usually they don't include the switches. Uh, though there are uh, vendors who sell a full stack solution that includes everything, including the switches in one rack. Again, that comes, you know, it's a good point, John, in that it's packaging in that a lot of what we'll call the the ones running around with the HCI flag, they tend to be smaller, 
so that in their particular nodes, or if they're using like a fat twin or a, a quad, in other words, a dual server in a common uh, uh, 2U, 5U, whatever, or a quad where you've got four servers in one chassis, uh, they can get away with having a switch in the chassis because they're just going from port to port to port. But they might have a middle of rack or a top of rack um, solution. And those, that, as they start to scale, they will introduce a, um, a switch. If you go into some of the bigger solutions that you're starting to see appearing in the market, they will have more of that networking capability either in a particular family or in a particular lineup so that as you scale, again, it's just, the switch is already there. You're just plugging in the existing components into it. But yeah, that's a good uh, thing to keep in mind is how will you add? That goes back to that slide that was kind of busy about that scaling. How will you tie all these individual CI, HCI nodes together as a part of a bigger and bigger cluster? Okay, very good. Here's a question that it could relate to your slide where you talked about, uh, you mentioned that hyperconverged isn't always cheaper to buy, but it provides those other savings. And you had another slide where you said you have to make sure you don't get to hypercomplexity. So I think this question relates to one or both of those. The question is, one of the HCI selling points is simplicity and cost reduction from compared to buying everything a la carte. It seems that from what is being presented, that may not always be the case. Can you elaborate on where or when HCI may be more complex or more costly? Yeah, I think what it comes down to is keep in mind that, you know, people get focused on cost and cost cutting, and they forget this concept of value, okay? I use the analogy of the, of the cloud, John, which is that uh, if I want to save money, I go buy the resource and run it in-house, and the cloud can be cheaper, like leasing a car versus buying it uh, helps with cash flow. But if I'm going to use it very extensively, it might be better off buying it, okay? And the cloud, on the other hand, gives you more value, more capability. Same thing with converged, hyper-converged, is that you can go out and buy the server, you can go out and buy the software, uh, you can go out and buy all the tools and glue them together and maybe come up with a lower total cost of materials um, with a uh, lower uh, bill of materials than buying a converged solution. However, what is your time worth? What is the value of your time or your staff's time to integrate, to glue, to keep all that together initially? What is the cost to acquire? to do the evaluation, to do the acquisition, to go through the purchasing process, to go through the deployment, the ordering cycle, the setup, the, st the initial stand-up on day one, on day two, and then the ongoing care and feeding. That's where you start to look at um, not just the ongoing operating expenses, but what's the total value of that experience, but also what's that value for enabling your applications. Excellent point, that there could be multiple aspects to looking at the cost consideration. We've got two minutes left. Let me see how many more questions I can squeeze in. Uh, and here's a question about uh, offload, and I swear it's a uh, viewer question. It's not from me. It says, can you offload the CPU cycles caused by I.O. to another CPU? It's an interesting question, is that, uh, <laughs> yeah, move the application to another CPU. <laughs> you know, part of that is that, if you've got to uh, move the work over, there is some software. There are some solutions that will leverage the uh, the resources, whether they be on another CPU for running part of the workload over there or part of running the stack. Keep in mind, most of these converged, hyper-converged solutions are running on some software stack, and we know that software always requires some hardware. Even if it's serverless, it still requires hardware somewhere. Now, okay. what some solutions will do, John, is use offload cards or using okay. ASICs or Greg, using FPGA. Greg, Greg let me, I, I love to talk about offload cards, but let me move on and try to get two more questions in. Uh, one question is, is, in which case can we use HCI for inhomogeneous workloads, which I take it to mean uh, when does the workload have to be homogeneous or can I use it for a mixed workload and still deploy HCI? Good question. That's going to come down to the particular product. If the product supports homogenous, guess what? You're stuck with homogenous. If it supports heterogeneous, whether in the same cluster but on different nodes, that's a flexibility. So that's one of those questions you have to look at when looking at the different vendors. 
Okay. Next question is, what does FUSE stand for, F-U-Z-E? Yeah, it's basically a term. It's fusing as in like melding, welding, bringing together, fusing two different things together. And fuse is a term that is used with the micro tearing from a particular vendor um, where they literally fuse a fast tier to a slow tier to keep, create a larger aggregate. Okay, great. Thank you. And one last question, and then I'll have to wrap it up. Uh, and this is a, a specific technical storage uh, performance question. Does the RAID stripe size make much difference when using SSDs with a database application? I assume they mean in a con hyperconverged setting. What's the best practice? So best practice on yeah, RAID I mean, stripe yeah. size? Yeah, it, that's going to that's going to vary. I mean, if your database is doing small IOs, you're going to want to you're going to maybe you're going to have smaller chunks. Certainly, spreading those out over more drives. You know, whether you're running traditional RAID or you know parity, erasure code parity type. You know. Spreading it out is, is going to give you some sort of a benefit, both from a performance as well as a uh, availability standpoint. But there again, look at a particular solution and see how it addresses those different capabilities, those different attributes. Terrific. Okay, so there are about three or four questions that we didn't get to, but we will answer those in written format in a blog published uh, hopefully in the next week to week and a half. So I would like to ask, I would like to thank Greg for being our presenter and thank everyone who attended live. Uh, the slides will be available as a PDF. Also, this webcast is available on demand uh, probably within a few minutes uh, after we close this. We do ask that you rate the webcast, provide a rating and feedback. Uh, and also uh, keep in mind if you have want to see other webcasts about storage topics or storage networking, we have a lot of webcasts available on the SNEA website. The URL is shown here. Go to snea.org slash forum slash ESF. You can go to the SNEA.org site and search for uh, webcasts. Uh, as I mentioned, the Q&A, including the questions that we answered and the questions we didn't get to, would post it online in the SNEAESFblog.org. And you can follow us on Twitter at SNEAESF. You can also follow Greg on Twitter at StorageIO. Uh, so that's at StorageIO on Twitter. And so, again, a big thank you to Greg for presenting today, and a big thank you to everyone who attended. We will have to wrap up this webcast but uh, please do, if you have a chance, provide a rating and come back and look for the blog with the rest of the unanswered questions, which will be answered uh, on the SNEA website. Greg, any final comments or final thoughts? No, I think that uh, really sums it up. Other than, again, just keep your applications, keep your workload in mind, and uh, keep exploring, keep expanding your tradecraft skills, and thank you all for attending. Great. And with that, we'll wrap up the webcast. Again, thank you, everyone, for attending, and we look forward to our next SNEA webcast, uh, which you can find listed on Bright Talk or the SNEA website.